Hi, my name is Georg. I'm a software developer and a developer and inner source advocate at Bosch IO in Germany. I fell in love with open source in 2007 when I started my first uh, open source community. And since then, I'm a strong believer in the power of community. So when my company offered me the chance to help kickstart inner source at Bosch and run the first open source, uh, inner source community, uh, I really didn't have to think twice and I never regretted that decision. It was by far the best time of my professional life. Uh, I met Denise and the Inner Source Commons in 2015 at the very first Inner Source Commons Summit in Palo Alto. And it was actually then that I learned that what we were doing at Bosch was called Inner Source and we called it Bosch Internal Open Source or BIOS for short. But this talk is not primarily about how we did Inner Source at Bosch. Uh, you can learn more about how we started it and how we ran it in the book Adopting Inner Source that Denise and Klaas wrote with the community. Uh, and you can also watch the talk that I gave at OSCON 2017. This talk is about the relationship between inner source and open source. And it was triggered by a talk that Malcolm Herbert from Red Hat gave at the last Spring Summit in Galway. And at the end, he asked the question, does inner source create more problems than it solves? And I remember my immediate reaction was, what? How can you possibly ask that question? And then it dawned on me, hmm, this is a relevant question, actually. And in this talk, I would like to provide an answer uh, to this question. So um, the first question that you have to answer, of course, is why should I do inner source in the first place in my company? So what are the benefits of inner source? How would you sell that to your company? What are the arguments for inner source? Well, I can tell you how we sell it at Bosch. Um, at Bosch, we, are, we have many different product classes and we are building more and more connected products to build the Internet of Things. And in order to do that, we also need to build a connected company. Why? Because people need to collaborate to build this Internet of Things. And we need to collaborate across organizational units. We have to collaborate across uh, locations. And we have to collaborate across time zones which is, of course, really hard. And in this environment, we have to be able to exchange knowledge so that everyone can participate in a project and contribute. And for us, it's very challenging because we have quite a few associates. We have many people working in research and development, and we, have, we are massively distributed over the world. So the task that InnoSource helps us with is to work across silos in this challenging environment. And here's a little infographic that shows you uh, the degree to which InnoSource helped connect the different business units. Uh, in this infographic, every little segment that you see, like every colored segment is a business unit. And this is what the collaboration looked like only after a few years. And uh, a few years back, we've done a survey <clears throat> among those who practition, uh, practice InnoSource. And what we learned from this survey was that InnoSource actually helped people reduce development costs, increase the speed of development. Uh, it has a positive impact on software quality. It accelerated learning and it made Bosch a more attractive company for software talent. And really important for a technology company like Bosch, it did boost innovation. Here's my favorite example. This is a project called Virtual Visor, which started as a BIOS hosted project and the initial development and proof of concept was done in BIOS before it actually became more formal and turned into a real product. So here's the, the general idea. Uh, you all know how difficult and dangerous it is to drive into, uh, into sunset or sunrise with a low, uh, low hanging sun. And this is in fact the most dangerous a dangerous weather condition that there is more dangerous than ice or snow for instance and the idea of these developers here this is uh, jason by the way he's the one who started all this um, they basically put a camera on the dashboard uh, the camera constantly films the driver so it knows where the eyes of the driver are it also knows where the sun comes from and then it selectively blocks out uh, a piece of an otherwise translucent visor and basically thus blocks out the sun and what looked like this before now looks like this. And I think this is a fantastic contribution and a fantastic example for what we can do in BIOS and in inner source. But there's a reason that Malcolm made that hypothesis at the last Spring Summit in Galway. Um, and of course, yes, there are challenges 
quite a few actually, and I'm just going to run through them real quick. So there's the tax challenge. That's probably the most prominent challenge for those who have already started their inner source journey. Um, just to explain it real quick, the example is, let's say that somewhere uh, at Bosch in the US writes a piece of software and puts it in an inner source repository, then a German Bosch employee or business unit uses this piece of software for free, and then Bosch in Germany makes millions with it. Then the US can declare losses because people actually invested some time in writing this software, and all the taxes for the wins uh, in Germany are paid in Germany. And the American tax authorities wouldn't like that very much, of course. There are also legal challenges when you set up InnoSource in a company with many different legal entities. Um, so who can use the software, who can monetize the software, who has to take care of liability and warranty, for instance. And of course, management wants to be assured that this is all legal that we're doing here. Um, it can also be a problem for export control. So, for instance, the American export control laws are triggered when you publish software in a company with many legal entities. And mostly that concerns strong encryption, for instance. Also, it is really difficult uh, in most companies, I would say, to reach critical mass. Uh, you know the, the ratio in open source project, then there's one uh, maintainer uh, has one uh, no, one maintainer for 100 committers for 100 users, I think is the ratio. So if you translate that, it would mean that one committer for every 10,000 employees in a company. And even for a company as big as Bosch, that is a challenge. Also, when you do inner source as a side job, as many of us did uh, for a while, there can of course be a conflict with your day job and you need to adjust your priorities for this. Also, for the same reason, when you do it as a side job, it's probably not career relevant, at least it's not guaranteed that it will be. Um, then there's a works council, of course, that wants to have a say in what people do, and they don't like the idea of people doing stuff on the side, of course. And, of course, the silos that I talked about earlier, they will not just go away. So if you contribute to something that's not in your silo or that someone outside of your silo benefits from, your manager might not approve that. And finally, and possibly most importantly, um, there's, there could be a cultural mismatch, especially when you're applying inner source in a more traditional business. And of course, company cultures can take forever to change. Uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast is the famous quote here from Peter Drucker, Drucker. Also, there's no standard way of doing inner source, really. Every company seems to be doing it slightly different, which is understandable, of course, because the context is different. It would be really nice, of course, to have a single recipe for doing inner source, um, but there is no such recipe. Instead, we are working on a couple of patterns in the inner source comments, which I would encourage you to check out. So, I'm pretty sure that these challenges have led to the picture that Malcolm was drawing at the last inner source summit. So, was Malcolm right after all? <laughs> so, should companies skip inner source and go straight to open source instead? And the answer is, it depends. <laughs> so let's go through them one by one. So the first question to ask is, uh, if you want to decide whether or not to do open source or inner source, do you have something of value to share? Of course, not everything can be shared. We talked about export control, for instance. Not everything should be shared, uh, for instance, core IP. And in BIOS, for instance, it's not clear when we start something new if it will eventually turn into IP or not. Um, or software that is so proprietary uh, it makes no sense to share because it's just not useful for others. Uh, code quality might not be high enough uh, and you don't want to be embarrassed by publishing code that has low code quality. And it also the code might just not be designed for participation. Um, monolithic code. But let's assume you have something to share. And the next question is, is there a strategic decision to open source in place? Because open source as a default is not a good idea, in my opinion. Uh, companies are just not about altruism. So open sourcing is a strategic decision with a goal in mind. For instance, lead a standardization effort or uh, establish an industry partnership or disrupt an incumbent in a proprietary market. So processes and resources to do open source must be in place and again, uh, it is a strategic decision. So let's assume such a decision is in place. And the final question is, are you ready to do open source? 
you might have something worth sharing and there's also a strategic decision in place, but your company might not be ready in terms of capabilities, in terms of culture, uh, might not have experience in contributing or governing open source projects. And if they don't and still try it, that of course might backfire in terms of reputation and make developers quite unhappy. And I know a model with four stages that you probably know as well, that is describing the maturity of a company for open source. And it has these four stages. First is denial, then people use open source and they start contributing. And finally, they are championing open source. And if your company is still largely in denial or has never even contributed anything, uh, maybe you shouldn't go straight uh, to champion an open source project. And if you're still learning how to do it, I think InnoSource might be a very worthwhile chapter in your journey towards open source. But let's assume even that is not a problem. And if the answer to all these questions is a resounding yes, then by all means do open source. So does open source magically solve all inner source related problems? Well, and the answer is, it depends. <laughs> so let's go through them one by one, one more time. So the tax problem is pretty much solved with open source. That is great. And that's what lawyers like about it. Legal is still a problem, but with foundations like Eclipse, for instance, many companies, especially specifically the traditional ones, feel more and more comfortable with doing open source because it provides a, a good legal framework. Setting that up still works, though, and companies should really go where the community is and not where the legal experts are. But I would say it's partially solved. Export control laws still apply, also if you do it open source. Uh, the same is true for local works council challenges that you might have in your company. The critical mass problem is pretty much solved with open source uh, if you do it right and not if you don't. <laughs> um, the conflict with the day job, depending on how your company uh, does open source, might still be the same, it might not be. I don't think it, open source really solves that problem. Uh, career is the same, but I would say it is kind of solved externally because if you have a career as an open source developer, you can probably easily get another job at another company. The silos also do not go magically away with open source. And I would say there's, there's not the way to do open source, but definitely there are some good role models. And again, if you, do, uh, if you join a foundation like the Eclipse Foundation, there are some standard processes how to develop it. And most importantly, though, the cultural differences do not go away only by doing open source rather than inner source. In fact, they might actually be exacerbated. Uh, and I think the most uh, obvious point for this is that open source has a perceived higher risk than inner source. In inner source, you, the, the, an attitude that I've seen often and I've done myself is that you don't really ask permission up front, you just ask for forgiveness later and just start developing and you know scratching your itch, so to speak. Open source, on the other hand, is more public. There's more at stake. I mean, the perceived risk of failing publicly is much bigger and very daunting for many managers and developers alike. So less people than with inner source tend to follow this model above, like don't ask permission, ask for forgiveness. Uh, there's a much higher barrier for open source. And as a result, there's a lot of potential for innovation that we've talked about earlier that's not being realized if open source were the only model that you had at your disposal. Um, yeah, another indicator I think for this risk is that in many companies, open source trainings are mandatory and also make sense in my opinion. Uh, but for inner source, you have no such thing. So the answer is, does open source really solve all the problems? Well, it does solve some really important ones, taxes, reaching critical mass, for instance, but it's absolutely not a silver bullet to solve your collaboration problems that you might have in your company. And if you can't do open source, you should definitely consider inner source. So open source and uh, inner source are not an either or kind of thing. They both have their place in the corporate world and they can complement each other as we've seen before, where you can learn how to uh, do community, if you will, how to design software for participation in inner source and then transfer that knowledge to the open source world. 
And open source does not at all make inner source obsolete or unattractive. But the real killer argument for the open source working model, so both for open source and inner source, in my opinion, is that it is way more humane than other competing development models. And as a result, if it's good for people, then it must also be good for companies because, you know, companies are made up of people, of course. And what I have witnessed myself in my time doing inner source is that inner source attracts the best people, the best developers. And it provides an environment in which they can work with passion, in which they can show initiative and in which they can unleash their full creative potential. And a company in which this happens is, of course, a great company to work for. So I would say InnoSource is at the intersection of what companies want and what developers want. But again, what about the challenges? I think, in my opinion and in my experience, they can be tackled by a small and dedicated team. Uh, this is the team here at Bosch uh, that is doing InnoSource. Uh, and those can actually tackle the problems and not everyone has to suffer or you know feel the pain of these challenges that are there of course and the, the reward for doing this sometimes boring often frustrating and tedious work is the feedback that we get from our users um, and uh, recently we did a survey for our inner source um, initiative that we have at Bosch we calculated the net promoter score and for those who don't know the scale goes from minus 100 to 100 percent negative values are generally bad positive values are good <clears throat> anything over 50 percent is considered really good world class and we are at a stunning 76 percent which is really out of this world we were very proud of this by comparison apple is only at 72 percent so <laughs> so wrapping up <clears throat> so does inner source create more problems than it solves I would say that both inner source and open source pose challenges, both do for corporations. And both can, we, can be well worth the invest uh, required to master these challenges. Also, it's not an either or kind of thing. They really complement each other. And I would like to quote again one more time, the inner source, uh, the law of inner sourcing from Tim O'Reilly, given enough developers, all software development emulates the best practices of open source software. And that's the end of the talk. And I close with my customary greeting. May the inner source be with you too. Thanks for listening.